the Canadian housing bubble may be on the verge of coming to an end, and it's because of rising interest rates. This is probably the most important video in this series so far, and so I'm expecting it to get almost no views. But this is what inspired me to start making these videos after over a decade of watching the market. So if you want to know what I'm concerned about, this is the one to watch. Before we get started, keep in mind that almost everything I'm about to tell you is not a prediction about the future or speculation. I'm describing things that have either already happened or that are happening right now. It's been covered a little bit in the news, but not in a very detailed way, so very few people are aware of what's going on. Now, there's going to be a lot of details and math in this video, and maybe another spreadsheet, but I'll try to make it easy to understand, and I promise that the longer you watch, the worse it gets. First, a little background. Since the 2008 financial crisis, central banks have been offering extremely low interest rates in order to stimulate investment. But this also has a major inflationary effect on the prices of real assets like houses because it's cheaper to borrow money to buy them. In Canada, we had over a decade of record low interest rates, with the central bank's policy rate never going over 2%. This has led to Canadian households taking on record levels of debt because carrying debt was so cheap. Our average household debt-to-income ratio rose to over 180%, mostly because of mortgage debt. We recently hit another new record at 185%, and keep in mind, that's an average. There's a lot of households out there with no debt, and that means there's a lot of other households out there with several times their income in debt. We've also taken on a huge amount of debt relative to the size of our economy. For reference, when the US bubble burst 15 years ago, their household debt-to-GDP ratio was 100%. In Canada, we've been over the 100% mark for the last 7 years. This has made us extremely vulnerable to rises in interest rates, because as soon as interest rates go up, it becomes a lot more expensive to carry all that debt. This has been the risk for the last 10 years, and it's only been getting bigger and bigger over time. And now, interest rates are going up. In March of 2022, the Bank of Canada started raising their policy interest rate in order to combat inflation. Over the past year and a half, they've raised the interest rate from 0.25% to 5%, and this has a big impact on mortgage rates. The people who are most affected by this in the short term are people with variable mortgage rates. Now, I've had a lot of people in the comments saying, but variable rate mortgages aren't that common. Who's getting a variable rate mortgage? And over the past few years, the shocking answer to that question is, most people in Canada. In 2021 and 2022, when house prices were peaking, over half of all new mortgages were variable rate. And most of those are variable rate fixed payment mortgages, which means that if interest rates go up, you pay more interest, but your payment stays the same. So more of it goes to interest and less of it goes to paying down the loan. In part five of this series, I talked about the trigger rate for this type of mortgage, which is the interest rate where you're no longer paying down your principal at all and all of your payment is going to interest. And if you exceed that rate, then there's more interest going back onto the balance of your loan every month. And this report from National Bank estimates that 73 to 80% of those variable mortgages originating from 2020 to 2022 have now hit their trigger rate. And keep in mind, this report was published in January, and there have been two more rate hikes since then. Also, home prices are down about 12% from the peak, so at the same time these people's mortgage rates are rising, their equity is getting wiped out. Now, obviously that all sounds very concerning, but it's also very abstract, so I wanted to show you what this looks like in real life. And how am I going to explain it to you? Obviously I made another spreadsheet. What else did you possibly think I was going to do? Here we're looking at an example of someone who bought a house in January of 2022 for $750,000. They put a 10% down payment on a mortgage at 1.5% interest. Their mortgage rate is going to go up in line with the bank's interest rate hikes, and the property valuation will follow the actual national home price index. I'm looking at a three-year term here, so for everything after the present, I hold the home price index and the interest rate steady. First, let's look at a variable rate variable payment mortgage. As you can see, their payment goes from $2,700 a month to over $4,300 a month, and because of the way mortgage amortization works, more of their money is going towards interest and less is going towards principal every month. We also see that the drop in home prices erodes almost all of their equity until a bounce back this year. However, they are still paying off the mortgage. They spent just under $145,000 on mortgage payments, and a little over $46,000 of that went to principal repayment. So it's not great, but if they manage to cover those higher payments, they will pay down the mortgage eventually. But it gets worse. Most variable mortgages in Canada aren't variable payment. They're fixed payment. So let's take a look at that scenario. As you see here, the payment stays steady at $2,700 a month, but in November of 2022, they pass their trigger rate, and the interest charges are higher than the payment every month. And as you can see, their principal repayment goes negative, and they're actually losing hundreds of dollars against the principal every month. So over the course of this three-year term, their home equity is eroded to almost nothing, and their principal repayment is actually slightly negative. They paid almost $100,000 in mortgage payments, but their loan balance has actually increased by $1,200. They also only have about $2,400 in home equity left. So they basically lost their entire down payment, they spent another hundred grand on the mortgage, but they actually owe more than they did three years ago. And that's before accounting for any other costs like taxes, maintenance, and insurance. But don't worry, it gets worse. The real trouble starts at renewal. When this person qualified for a mortgage, they qualified a stress test interest rate of 5.25%. That means at that interest rate, they would be paying the highest amount that the bank considers them reasonably capable of paying, which is about $4,000 a month. 
However, their rate is now 6.25%, which is going to translate to a payment of about $46.50 a month. Now, assuming they're with a federally regulated lender like a bank, they won't need to requalify and they won't be denied a renewal as long as they've been making their mortgage payments on time. And as long as they can keep making the new payments of $46.50 a month, they can keep the mortgage. But that new payment is $6.50 a month higher than they were assessed as being reasonably able to afford, and it's 72% higher than the $2,700 a month they were planning on paying. Another option would be to make a lump sum payment at renewal to reduce their monthly payments going forward. But to get their monthly payment down to that $4,000 that they're reasonably able to afford, they would have to put down a lump sum payment of $95,000. And if they only had $70,000 to put down in the first place, how likely is it that they have another ninety-five dollars to put in, especially when their payments are about to skyrocket? There's another potential problem they're going to face at renewal, which is that if they want to refinance, the stress test rate is going to be even higher, something like 8%. And unless they've had a big increase in income or a big reduction in other debts, they're not going to qualify for a new mortgage. That means they're pretty much going to be stuck with whatever rate their current lender decides to give them. Alternatively, they could go to an unregulated lender, which tends to have more flexible terms up front, but won't offer them the same protections that they would have with a regulated mortgage. The fact of the matter is, no matter how you approach it, this person's going to be paying a lot more in interest than they initially planned for, and it's going to be enormously financially stressful. People in this situation are in serious trouble. And a lot of mortgage brokers and lenders are now going into triage mode and just trying to find solutions to keep people from being forced to sell their homes. However, if people are forced to sell right now, they'll be selling into a market where prices have dropped and people have substantially less borrowing power to play with. It's entirely possible that people will be selling at a loss, and if they're underwater on the mortgage, meaning that they owe more than the house is worth, the situation is even worse. People often say that when you have a mortgage, you don't own the house, the bank does. But the actual situation is more precarious. You own the house and you owe the bank whatever you paid for it, even if prices drop. Almost all mortgages in Canada are recourse loans, meaning that if the bank doesn't recover everything you owe them from the sale of the house, they can come after your other assets for the rest. Unlike in the US crisis, people can't just give up the house and walk away from the debt. In Canada, if you're forced to sell when you're underwater, you could not only lose the house and all the money you put into it, but some of your other savings as well. Now so far, we've only talked about variable rate mortgages, but in Canada, fixed rate mortgages will be coming up for renewal as well. And in recent years, only about 20-25% to of mortgages were fixed for 5 years or more, the rest are shorter term. So while variable mortgage holders are the leading edge of the problem, we're going to be seeing these fixed rate mortgages come up for renewal from now until about 2027. And if rates don't come back down, those people are also going to be under a lot more financial stress. And our core measures of inflation, even excluding housing, are still plateauing above the 2% inflation target. So it's entirely possible the bank will continue to hike interest rates if they consider it necessary to hit the 2% inflation target. So if interest rates stay where they are or continue to increase, we're going to see a lot of households having all of their income vacuumed up by interest payments. That's bad for the economy, and more importantly, it's bad for people who are trying to lead happy, fulfilling lives. Because they're going to be selling a lot of the productive years of their life to the bank, all because they were convinced that real estate is a great investment at any price. And that's important to keep in mind here. We're not just talking about numbers, we're talking about people. The unfortunate thing is, this needed to happen sooner or later, and it was always going to be a painful process. People can't just take on more and more debt forever and never expect any kind of correction. And delaying this process for so many years has only made things worse and worse. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see the bubble burst and have a sharp decline in prices. But with a lot of people no longer able to afford the houses that they already own, it's hard to see how we're going to sustain our current prices, let alone big increases in prices going forward. That's it for today, but stay tuned for next time when I'm going to be talking about the impact of cheap debt and how we got here in the first place. I also want to thank everyone who's been watching, as well as Hannah, Jessica, and Flavio for supporting the channel. It means a lot to me that people think listening to me yammer about this kind of stuff is worth their time, let alone any kind of money. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.